It's nice to see you all here. Oh, that was nice. I got some good mornings back. <laughs> yeah. Morning. 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 <laughs> so for those of you who don't know me, my name's Megan. I'm David. And we're just here to give you guys a great big welcome to church this morning. That's right. And we have a few rules here at Gatesgate. Yes, we do. Two important ones. Um, I'll start off with the first one. You don't have to believe to belong. And The second one is that there is no perfect people allowed here. Nice. So if it's your first time here this morning, just sit back, relax. We just want you to feel like you can really be a part of what's going on here. And we're just so grateful to have you here. That's right. Later. See you. Uh, it's awesome to be part of a church where uh, so much is happening and it takes so many volunteers to do so much that goes on. Just awesome. So uh, it's my job this morning to um, start us off and uh, do a welcome to sing. And uh, usually we just do one song, but this morning I want to introduce two songs. Those two songs are This Is My Testimony and This Is Amazing Grace. Because today, This Is My Testimony that two years ago, on the 16th of March, I put down the bottle, and I'm two years old this morning. <laughs> Woo. And there's a saying about grace. Grace is what you get what, when you don't deserve, and it is what you, get, what, what you don't get that you do deserve. And I can tell you that for the last 730, however many days, it's taken amazing grace every single day to uh, walk this amazing journey. So with that, let's get up and let's sing. Uh, this is amazing grace. I'm 
Satan fall like lightning I saw darkness run for cover song that we're going into is called Oceans and to me it is a song that invites us to go deeper. It's an invitation to take our eyes off our current situations, whatever we're facing, off our fear and to choose to place it on someone that is so much bigger than what we're going through. And for me that is a God who loves us so, so deeply and cares for us more than we can ever imagine. So I just want to encourage you that wherever you are in your faith journey, to just imagine what it would look like to take that next step, to go a little bit deeper. There's a line in this song that I really love, and it says, In oceans deep, my faith will stand. 
And it just makes me think that when the hard times, when the hard times come, and because they do, where are you putting your faith? Is it in things, resources, people? Or maybe you're a bit like me and have the tendency to put it in your own willpower, your own strength and your own abilities, rather than choosing to look to God. Recently, I've just been walking through this season where a friendship of mine, someone who I've pretty much grown up with, did school with and all of that, um, was really tested. And I realized that I was trying to control the outcome of this friendship. I was holding on to it so tightly. I wasn't willing to let it go or even just offer it up to God. And what I found was that when I chose to put my faith and my trust in a God who's so much bigger, who can see the bigger picture, I just experienced this peace, just this overwhelming peace that I came to a place where it didn't actually matter where the friendship ended up. I knew that it would be okay. And I just really want to encourage you to not only reflect on where you are in your own faith journey and what it looks like for you to take that next step, but also to look a little bit deeper and to see if there's anything that you are holding on to tightly. And if you were to offer that up to God, just, yeah, be open to what He wants to do and the peace that you can experience that from Him. So as we head into this next song, just take your eyes off your own situations and put it on Him and see what He can do.
on here, I pray that everyone opens their mind and opens their hearts and hears the word today. And just like that song says, you know, um, I open my faith and I praise you, and I know that you're there when I can wander through the water. God, thank you. Please let us all hear today what we need to hear in our hearts. Amen. Let me introduce both of us, in case you haven't met us before. My name's Bree. Hi, I'll be talking to you today. Hi. And this is Wade, obviously an incredibly talented artist um, that's part of our community. <laughs> no, you are. Um, and yeah, we've asked Wade to be here today, and he's actually going to be painting. He's going to be continuing this painting all throughout the rest of our program. So while I speak, maybe through the last song, we'll see how we go. But the reason that we're doing this is because what he's going to paint is literally the thing I want you to get out of today, the thing that I want to stick in your head. So if you're zoning out, you're sick of listening to me or looking in this direction, look over there. Okay, so you can check out what Wade's going to be doing. He's just going to be going the whole time today. All right, so let's get into it. We're going to recap because at the moment we're in this series called Launch. And if you've been with us the past few weeks, this series is kind of unpacking and exploring the book of Acts, which is a book in the Bible. We've been learning about the early church, the like ancient first ever church that was around, and how it impacts us here today. And in the first week, Wes shared with us, and he shared that actually God believes in you, each one of you, and he wants to use you. And then we had Zal speak to us about how we're better t together and how we need connection, healthy connections in our life. And then Wes shared again about the power of the Holy Spirit, and that that's a gift that each of us gets, and the difference that that can make in our lives. And then last week, hopefully we'll all remember, I'm sorry I didn't bring my chocolates this week like Jamie did, but Jamie had dished out chocolates, and he spoke to us about saying yes, even when what we're being called into is a little bit scary. And this week, it is my privilege to talk to you guys about a topic that is called breaking barriers, building bridges. And you might be noticing what's already going on <laughs> over there. There might be a bridge being built. <laughs> and so we're going to be speaking about this, looking into the, our next chapter in the book of Acts. And we're going to be asking this question, what am I building? Now, can I start by asking, um, who's good at building? I'll put my hand down because I'm not good at building anything. <laughs> but yeah, you can put your hands up. I love the interactive time. Thank you. Cool. Very good. Well, what I'm posing to us today is that we are all building something. We're either building a barrier in our life 
or we're building a bridge. And so we're going to look at these two things, and we're going to start by looking at a barrier. So what is a barrier? It's something that we put up or we might construct because we think it's going to protect us, right? But in the end, it's something that kind of holds us back, something that inhibits us from living life fully. I'll give you an example of um, like a day-to-day barrier that I struggle with in my own life. It is the barrier of numbers, just like maths in general, really. Um, I don't know if you can relate, but basically when people start talking like maths or fractions, percentages, ratios, this is what happens in my head. I kind of zone out, I glaze over, it's like numbers are floating through the air, I'm gone. (laughs) And I don't know about you guys, like I was never good at maths in school, and to this day, I just don't get it. But I know this is limiting for me, right? It's like this is a barrier in my life. I'm going to throw my sister under the bus now because she has a barrier in her life. She loves the ocean, but she'll refuse to swim a lot of the time. And do you know why? She's deathly afraid of crabs. <laughs> right? Like, she can swim. Like, that's not the issue. But if, if the, you know, the beach is, like, shelly or it's a little bit rocky or it looks like a crab might live there, she won't swim. And do you know what? That's a barrier for her because she's missing out on these incredible experiences of the ocean or places to swim. So what could a bridge look like? A bridge is literally the thing that bridges the gap from where we are to where we want to be. You know, for me, in my struggles with maths, that could look like being open and teachable to actually having someone share with me some of the, I don't know, I don't even know how to explain maths. Ugh. Share with me how to figure it out. I could be more teachable, right? And then maybe I would learn how to do things like budgeting a whole lot better, or maybe I'd even learn something about like investing. My sister, if she built a bridge, could be something as simple as going and buying those little aqua water shoes that you can put on your feet, and then she wouldn't have to worry about what's in the ocean. A bridge is something that allows us to move forward right in our life. And so today, we're asking, are you building a barrier or a bridge in your own faith journey? So, we're going to dive into this passage in the book of Acts. And before we start reading all the verses, I'm going to give you like a really fast history lesson, catch us up to where we're at. Um, Stick with me, I'll try and make it interesting and fun. Basically, the book of Acts is the fifth book in the New Testament of the Bible, and it is set within the first century of when Jesus was on earth, when he walked the earth, when he taught, when he died, when he rose. It's literally just after that time. So all of the characters that we actually see within the book of Acts are real guys who literally knew Jesus firsthand. Like they were his friends, his followers, his disciples. They, they were there. They saw this. They heard what he said. And they are now the people that we know as the apostles, which is basically a fancy word for the teachers who are traveling around the ancient world of that time and teaching this gospel of Jesus. And so where we're going to pick up the story today is looking at these two guys called Paul and Barnabas and their kind of return from their teaching. Now, things had been pretty hectic for them. They've been out teaching in all these different cities for a while now, and if you've been here for the last couple of weeks, you'll know some of those stories. And it was basically an emotional roller coaster for them. And do you know why? It's because they would go into a city, there would be hundreds or thousands that would come to hear these guys speak. And do you know what? The majority would actually believe and they would have faith and they would believe this message of Jesus and become Christians themselves. However, it wasn't all butterflies and rainbows because the city officials, kind of the powers that be of that day, they didn't like this message. They didn't like something different coming in. And so they would come, they would arrest the apostles, they'd often be beaten, persecuted sometimes killed, but essentially always kicked out and like deported from that city. And then the pattern would start again because they'd go to another city and they'd speak to all the rest of the new people and the pattern would continue from city to city. And so where we're going to pick up our story today is where Paul and Barnabas have come home to their home church and they've come there to to share with everyone, with their fellow believers, guys, this is what's been happening. 
Um, it's been crazy, but it's been awesome. We've seen all these works of God, and they just want to have a rest as well. However, the rest gets cut short because there's a little bit of conflict, a little bit of tension in the church. And so Paul and Barnabas start to hear murmurings of this tension. And the tension is basically some of the Jewish Christians, the really traditional guys who were Jews, but now they're Christians, they believe in Jesus, but they are not happy with all these new believers around the world who don't have to do anything to be a Christian. They're not keeping all the laws and the traditional Jewish rules, and these guys are not happy about it. And they're trying to say, actually, we believe that all these new Christians should have to keep all of the Jewish laws and rules and traditions. And this is not just a few. There were over 600 Jewish laws. It was a total lifestyle change. And they were trying to say, actually, no, you have to do that before you're allowed to be a follower of Jesus. Question. Does that sound kind of familiar in any way to you? This idea that actually you have to change. You have to show us how good you are. You have to be better. You have to show us you're worthy before you're allowed to be part of our club. Maybe you've experienced this before in like a church or a religious setting where you felt like you did have to measure up to a certain standard before you could be accepted. Maybe you've experienced this just in a friendship or a relationship where you were being forced to change who you were to fit someone else's idea of who you should be. Maybe you've felt this before in the relationship of a parent or someone in authority where they expect you to be perfect or behave a certain way before you are deserving of love or affection or care or affirmation. When Paul and Barnabas heard that this is the way that things were going, they were outraged. They had literally just given the past, I don't know, months, years of their life to traveling around, telling everyone how simple the message of Jesus was. And then these traditional Jewish Christians are coming in trying to make it complicated, trying to make it about the rules and make it really hard. So there was a lot of conflict and they actually decided, we are going to take this whole debate to Jerusalem, which is like the capital for the Jewish people. And they held their first ever kind of big church council. And this is where we're going to start reading today, where they are debating this whole thing. It's a big council. It's involving all the churches of all the land. And they're talking about this tension, arguing about it. And this is where we see a guy called Peter stand up to address everyone. Now, some of us have heard the name Peter before. And this is a Peter who we know. This is Peter who was one of Jesus' closest friends and followers. This is Peter who was one of the disciples. He was the dude who walked on water. He was also the guy who denied Jesus three times. And he was also the first disciple to physically see Jesus after he rose from the dead. So we're going to listen to what this guy's going to say. We pick up the story in Acts chapter 15. It says this. Then Peter took the floor. Friends, you well know that from early on, God made it quite plain that he wanted the pagans, pagans just means the non-Jews, to hear the message of this good news and embrace it. We're going to continue. Because he says, he says, and not in any second hand or roundabout way, but first hand, straight from my mouth. He's basically saying, guys, remember, Jesus told us that this message of hope and life and redemption and freedom and all this great stuff is for everyone. It's not just for the Jewish people, it's for everyone. And he throws in that little reminder at the end that like, this isn't some, you know, five degrees of separation. This is literally the words that I heard Jesus speak and I'm now repeating them to you. And so he continues, and God who can't be fooled by any pretense on our part, but always knows a person's thoughts, gave them the Holy Spirit exactly as he gave him to us. 
He treated the outsiders exactly as he treated us, beginning at the very centre of who they were and working from that centre outward, cleaning up their lives as they trusted and believed in him. I don't want us to miss what's going on here. Peter says that God cannot be fooled by any pretense on our part. That actually God looks and knows deeper than just the show and the facade that we put up on the outside. He knows what's going on on the inside. And he's saying that, guys, (laughs) even if you're good at keeping the laws and saying the right things and being perfect, that's not what matters to God. It's your thoughts, it's your heart, it's the inside that really matters. Faith doesn't work by fixing all the outside stuff and that making you acceptable. It works by allowing God to work on the inside. Doesn't that sound refreshing to you? Or maybe that actually sounds really confronting. That God knows what's going on in the inside for where we're truly at. We're going to keep reading because Peter finishes his little spiel with a challenge. He says, So why are you now trying to out-God God, loading these new believers down with rules that crushed our ancestors and crushed us too? Don't we believe that we are saved because the Master Jesus, amazingly and out of sheer generosity, moved to save us, just as he did those from beyond our nation? So what are we arguing about? He's like, guys, (laughs) we have spent generations in our culture, in this Jewish culture, being like oppressed by these rules. Like we can't even do them right. And now we're trying to put them onto someone else? What are we up to? We all believe who Jesus is and why he came and that he was about freeing us from the rules. So why are we trying to go back there? What are we arguing about? Sadly, I know this is often what you know, and religious people or church people like to do, right? To put rules on things. And so many of us have been hurt by the church before. And for the Christians of this time, they were being hurt by this. These old rules and laws were crushing them and creating barriers in their faith. So I want to ask you today, what is crushing you? What is a barrier in the context of your faith? Maybe, like the early church that we've just read about, you have experienced kind of this having to measure up before you can be accepted. Maybe that's your barrier. Maybe you've been hurt by people who claim to be followers of Jesus, but they behaved in a way that didn't really match what they preached. Maybe you've heard some things about faith that are really confusing or they scare you or they just downright put you off. Maybe you're putting some unrealistic standards on yourself. Maybe you don't feel like you're good enough, like you need to fix yourself, like you need to stop sinning before you can come before God. Maybe it's an expectation that's a barrier for you. Could be an expectation that actually this Saturday program right here is going to fill all of your spiritual needs and teach you everything you need to know, and then... When you realize you need more, you're left feeling a little bit disappointed. Maybe it's an expectation that you should always feel connected to God or that every program and every event is for you. Maybe it's an expectation that when you get baptized, your life is magically perfect or an expectation that once you believe in Jesus, there's no more struggles an expectation that actually now my relationships will be right and good and easy. Maybe a barrier for you is that you've prayed. You've cried out to God. You've asked for something and your prayers just seem to keep going unanswered. And now that's formed a barrier of disappointment. You feel like maybe you're being punished for some reason or God's ignoring you or maybe he just doesn't exist after all. Maybe you have doubts and questions, and the more that you sit with them and allow them to fester, the more your walls go up. Maybe it's fear. Maybe it's your past trauma that you haven't really dealt with, and it's a barrier for you. 
Maybe the grudges and the pain you're holding on to as a barrier. The negative self-talk, the comparison trap, the insecurities, or maybe it's the pride and the ego that's really building your barrier. Maybe it's simply that we just don't have enough time or that we don't make time to focus on our relationship with God. Because, you know, the demands of life, of work, of other people, of family, outweigh the importance of our faith. Or maybe we've just become complacent and we're actually totally okay with where we're at in life. You know, it's not too bad, it's not too good, it's just okay and we're okay with that. Can you relate to any of these barriers? I know I can. And the thing about barriers, right, is they stop us. They hold us back, they cage us in, they isolate us. They don't let us out, but they also don't let anyone else in. And this is the thing. Barriers separate us from others, and barriers separate us from God. And this is what was happening in the early church. And Peter was calling them out. He was saying, guys, you're building barriers in a place that we're meant to build bridges, and it's not okay. And so we're going to have a look and read what happens next. In verse 12, it says, There was dead silence. No one said a word. With the room quiet, Paul and Barnabas reported matter-of-factly on the miracles and wonders that God had done among the other nations through their ministry. The silence deepened. You could hear a pin drop. James broke the silence. Friends, listen. Simeon, that was just another word for Peter. Peter has told us the story of how God, at the very outset, made sure that all the racial outsiders were included. And we're going to pause here before we read the second part of the verse, because I want to point out to you who James is. James is another person who was there with Jesus, because he was Jesus' brother, the half-brother of Jesus. And can I tell you, if there's anyone who should not believe that Jesus was the son of God, who he said he would, who he said he was, it would be his brother, right? Like, can you imagine growing up and your brother is like, I'm the son of God. You'd be like, ah, <laughs> no. But James is a believer. James is on board with this. And as we read on, we actually see James is, seems to be one of the leaders, like someone with a lot of authority in this council. And so he's just saying, he's like, guys, I'm just reiterating what Peter said. You know, Jesus told us this is for everyone. It's not just for you little Jewish clique, all right? And then he continues. So... Here is my decision. We are not going to unnecessarily burden non-Jewish people who turn to the master. He continues and he says, we'll write them a letter and tell them, be careful not to get involved in activities connected with idols, to guard the morality of sex and marriage, to not serve food offensive to Jewish Christians. The strongest argument for Jesus actually being the son of God James, his own brother, stands up and decides. He says, we should not unnecessarily burden. Other versions say, we should not make it difficult for people who are turning to God. Bottom line, anything that makes it difficult, we should remove. It's not about who's here in the room. It's about who's out there. It's about who hasn't met Jesus yet. And anything that we're doing that's making it difficult for those people is actually resisting the movement and the instruction of God. With this statement, he took the 613 Jewish laws and rules and condensed them into three be carefuls. Basically, he shared, you know, let's not cause division, let's not have disunity in the church, and let's just respect the Jewish culture by not doing anything with idols or eating anything offensive to them. And he said, don't be sexually immoral. So basically he's saying to them, guys, let's be culturally sensitive and let's be moral. That was all that they wanted to share with the new believers. And can you imagine the delight of Paul and Barnabas at this decision? They're like, 
We don't have to go back to like all those cities and thousands of people and be like, um, so guys, we forgot to mention the 613 rules. No, they don't have to do that. It gets to stay simple. This decision was the first recorded time that the early church said, no perfect people allowed. It was the first time that they really built this bridge between the tradition and the rules of the Jewish culture and this message of Jesus. It was the first time they asked this question of like, who gets in? And the answer was everyone. The answer was no perfect people. The answer was Jesus. The answer was a reminder that God looks at the inside, at the heart. Because, you know, God can purify a heart before you purify your life. God can purify your heart before you fix your addiction. God can purify your heart before you save your marriage. God can purify your heart before you overcome your insecurities. And when that question of who's allowed in comes up, the answer is everyone. They looked at how they could break down barriers for people who are trying to turn to God. And this is where we see the bridge being built. So let's talk about bridges. We've hopefully had a little bit of a think of what our barriers are for each of us, what that might be, what it might look like, what's holding us back in our faith. So now, what is our bridge going to be? How do we build a bridge? Well, a bridge, we know, is this structure that gets us from where we are to where we want to be. And we know that without a bridge, things are a lot harder. The bridge that the apostles built in this story was the same bridge that we value here at Gracegate, right? No perfect people. If you've come here more than once, you'll hear that all the time. It's the bridge of everybody's welcome. You don't have to believe to belong. Let's not make it hard. And it's our hope always here at Gracegate that we're not making it hard for you. We want to be here to build bridges and not barriers. We want to be here to show this community what we're for, not what we're against. The church is literally us, this group of people, connecting with one another and demonstrating the love of God. And it should be the biggest bridge. That's why Jesus was so controversial. He spent his whole life building bridges in a society constructed on barriers. He forgave. He hung out with the people that he wasn't meant to. He helped and he healed. He valued everyone. And he broke the traditional rules whilst doing it. Jesus even blatantly said to the religious leaders when they challenged him in Luke chapter 5, he said, actually, who needs a doctor? The healthy or the sick? I'm here inviting outsiders, not insiders, an invitation to a changed life changed inside and out. I think we also live on a society built on barriers, right? So I'm going to ask you today, if you're sitting here and you've been sitting in church for a while and you call yourself a Jesus follower, in this community, are you being a builder of bridges or of barriers? Because what's on the other side of the bridge is a deep and authentic and connected relationship with God on the other side of the bridge is life and hope and peace and freedom. And why wouldn't we want to have that? Why wouldn't we want everyone to have that? So what does it look like? How do we build a bridge? Usually, I would Google something like that because I don't know how to build a bridge. But luckily for me, I actually have a really good friend who is a official bridge engineer Structural engineer, civil engineer, all of those things. She's a bridge engineer. She literally, her job is to build bridges here in Wellington. She travels around. I asked her, what's the process of building a bridge? And she gave me a list of things. And I've got five of these things, which are our five steps for today on how to build a bridge. This is the last thing I'm going to share with you guys, so stay with me. All right. Step number one is to define the problem and the solution. We've already done this. We know the problem is the barrier, our barriers, right? The things that are 
holding us back in our faith, holding us back from even building a bridge. And the solution, the solution is having a bridge. The solution is Jesus. The solution is doing life together. Step number two is select the best team with the right capabilities. So have a think. Who's in your team? Who are the people that you're doing life with? Do they have the right capabilities? Are they people who pride themselves in trying to build bridges? Or are they people that like to build barriers? Are you walking alongside someone who's maybe built some bridges in their life before? Who's a few steps ahead of you? Who can give you some wise counsel? Who can speak with grace and truth into where you are and what your barriers might be? We all need to be building a bridge. We all need someone alongside us. So are you in a position where you need to maybe change out some of the people in your team and get together a team with the right capabilities? Or are you someone that could maybe journey alongside someone else and help to lead them in their bridge building process? Step number three, have a design statement, write a plan. Now, we don't have to, well, you could write it physically, but you don't have to. This is the nitty gritty of the how. In bridge building terms, this is like, okay, where's the foundations going? Is it gonna be one of the bridges that we like push out? Is it gonna be something we crane in? Is it gonna be like the Auckland Harbour Bridge where we clip the sides on eventually? It's the plan of the how. Now, I actually had an awesome chat with Wade about this while he was painting last week, about you know the how of the bridge building process. And he shared a little bit about his artistic process and how this really relates into what we're talking about. He shared that actually sometimes starting the, the painting, the bridge building process, you don't feel like it. You don't feel ready. But sometimes you just have to say yes. He shared that when you get stuck, when it's a struggle, maybe you just need to change your perspective. Because when you step back away from it, things tend to look different. He shared that if you're not happy with where you're at, then actually you need to reach out to someone who's done this before, someone who's a few steps ahead of you. And the last thing he said was don't underestimate the power of researching of spending time actually like studying and looking into what you're doing. So what's our plan? Do we need a perspective change? Do we need to reach out? Do we need to research? Here's some ideas of what that might look like. A perspective change could look like serving, taking the focus off yourself and off your life and actually looking into someone else's life and asking how you can serve them. Reaching out could look like joining a life group. We've got a bunch of great ones here. But it could also look like asking someone else to coffee, asking for them to share their story of faith with you and you sharing your story with them. Researching might look like actually spending time reading the Bible, listening to a podcast, or asking some of those questions that are big and scary, but we have a space for that. Which one of these do you need to add to your plan? Step number four, refer to the bridge manual. And yes, there is in fact a bridge manual I found out. A manual that every engineer in their bridge building process must refer to. And guess what our manual is? As Christians, as followers of Jesus, the Bible is our manual. And we've been given this book for a reason. Churches are literally built on this book for a reason. We can't disregard the importance of the manual. I know sometimes reading and understanding it can be really tricky. But this is where our team comes in. This is where we do life together and we ask someone who's read it for a little bit longer to help us. Or we ask a friend to, to read with us or start a Bible plan on the YouVersion app with us. So there's conversation, there's accountability, and there's connection. The Bible's full of stories of barriers and bridges. 
And we can learn so much from taking the time to uncover all the hidden gems. The words of God are in that book. So pay attention. Don't be like me with maths and just shut down because it's hard. Start building a bridge. And the final step is to verify. With engineers, they have to have someone else who's actually more equipped than they are check their bridge building plan. So who's checking your plan? Who are you being vulnerable and sharing your barriers and your bridges with? Share it with God. Share it with someone else. Get the encouragement that you need and stick to your bridge building. To close, we're always building something. So what are you building? If you're not building a bridge, then you're most likely building a barrier. If you're sitting here today and you're unsure about all this God stuff, I want to ask you, if you begin to build a bridge, just a bridge of discovery, of asking a few more questions, what have you got to lose? If you start breaking down some of those barriers here, this is a really safe space. And I truly believe that you have a whole lot more to gain than you would ever lose. If you count yourself a Jesus follower, then I wanna challenge you in your bridge building. What is stopping you? What are those barriers in your own personal faith? We've been commissioned to build bridges. We're walking alongside people over those bridges. So are you building a bridge or a barrier? When we do build a bridge, when we really start moving forward in our personal faith, we open up the way for others to journey alongside us. When we live out a real and authentic relationship with God, we lead others into that same kind of relationship with Him. So what is holding us back from fully embracing that? This place Gracegate here exists because of how people, a lot of you guys, have already been bridge builders in this community. It exists because there have been hearts that have been moved to help. Because of generosity to change situations, to start programs and to build environments here. Bridges look like a community that offers care. It looks like people who'll make you feel like you belong, no matter where you've come from. It looks like someone who'll sit and listen to your story and share their story. And this is why we do what we do here. So just like in this painting, we can build a bridge to the whole city when we start breaking down barriers and building bridges in our own personal lives. It simply becomes an overflow of our own authentic and real relationship with Jesus. So, what are you going to build? I'm gonna invite our music team to come up now. And we're gonna finish today by just singing one last song. And as we sing, I want you guys to make this your own personal time with God. Whether you know the words and you're singing along, whether you're just gonna listen to the music, whether you're gonna keep watching the painting, I want you to ask yourself, what are the barriers I've got in my life? What bridges do I need to build? And what steps do I need to take today to start building? of the psalmist. I know there's a place I belong where I'll see the fullness of love. A child face to face with my God lost in your awesome wonder. Let's stand and sing.
child chasing shadows right back to the light. I was lost in a fog till you caught my eye. Through the smoke and the mirrors, the glimmer.
sharing such an incredible, incredible message. Um, and thank you as well to Wade for the amazing piece of art that we saw created right in front of us this morning. Um, you guys can take a seat and it would be awesome if you could just, yeah, give Wade a, a round of applause. Yeah.